Today is December 1st, 2022, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. So this is our once uh, a year annual meeting, and this is our final meeting of our regular session for 2022. And this will include a summary of the society's activities for the year, as well as the election of our new members. So it'll go just a little bit longer. Um, we welcome everyone who's joining us um, online. And, and again, this is a new format that we're trying, which is a hybrid format where we have uh, attendees uh, in person and we have uh, maybe 15 uh, individuals here in WG33 at the Museum of Natural History in Washington. Um, as well as I see 33 online. So it's great. It's great to see everyone. Um, also, you may have gotten a notification for those who are online that we are recording this meeting. So if you want to stay anonymous, just don't share your video and you should be okay. And uh, then the recording, as well as previous recordings of all of our meetings since uh, I guess October 2020 are in our YouTube channel um, and it's called NSOC Wash DC. It's right there. We have some really awesome talks <clears throat> and this this one talk. Okay. So 80. Yes. <laughs> nice. Okay. So uh, we now move on to reading and approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, will you please minute regular meeting? The 1231st regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington was called to order on November 3rd by a President Lourdes tomorrow. The meeting was a hybrid, both in person and virtual participants. Total members and guests were 52, with 37 virtual and 15 in person. Recording Secretary Gary Hebel read the minutes from the October meeting, and these were approved for the record. President-elect Matt Buffington presented the slate of officers for next year as follows. President-elect Don Weber, curator Alyssa Seaman, editor Mark Met, treasurer Abigail Kula, recording secretary Gary Hevel, program chair Alan Norbaum, membership and communications officer Elizabeth Young. Matt Buffington becomes president. A vote for this slate of officers will occur at the December meeting. Membership and Communications Secretary Elizabeth Young had one new applicant for membership, Cable Cox. Tonight, the four applicants from last month become official society members. Librarian Richard Green announced new additions to the entomology library, which included volumes on archaeo-entomology and paleontology. Other volumes featured Weevils of Japan, Birdwing Butterflies of Java, and a book of vampire moths presented by Scott Miller. Matt Buffington reported that spending some time in Stockholm during the summer allowed him to gain books on dung beetles, jumping spiders, grasshoppers, dragonflies, and mosquitoes. Matt noticed, noted that Swedish law requires common names for each species of insect in that country. President Chamorro noted that meetings with ESA and ECN are coming up soon. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Dr. Jeff Skevington from Agriculture Canada. 
whose title was Taxonomy and Next to Gen Phylogenomics of Flowerflies Diptosurfidae. For the past two decades, Jeff has studied surfids with some attention also to Pythonculidae. Surfids are well known and may generally be recognized as having a spurious vein in the wings. They are notorious for mimicry of wasps and bees. Comparative, comparative photographs were presented to demonstrate the similarities of colors and shapes, and audience members were challenged to distinguish surfids from various wasps. Over 6,200 surfids have been described by scientists, but this number will increase dramatically in the future. One advantage for gaining knowledge of surfids is by examining records from iNaturalist, which reveals present distribution of the flies. Jeff reviewed the subfamilies in the family with associated photographs. A discussion was presented regarding the development and the production of the comprehensive volume, Field Guide to Surfity of the Northeastern United States. A volume for the surface of the southeastern states may be forthcoming, but such a volume for the western United States presently has too many taxonomic issues. There are many questions from members of the hybrid audience, with the meeting officially ending at 8.30 p.m. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. And okay, so we have moved to approve the minutes by Mark Metz. Uh, do you are here a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? No? Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Okay, so now we move on to introduction of new members and visitors. Uh, Ms. Membership and uh, Recording Secretary Elizabeth Young, will you please announce new members and confirm others um, in their in this meeting, please. <laughs> oh, uh, we have three new member applicants to announce this month. Uh, their names are Zachary Dankowitz, Cynthia Wyman, and Michael Andrew Jansen. Uh, we have one official member uh, who was announced in member of last meeting is uh, Hazel Hawk. Uh, now, if there are any visitors here in person who'd like to introduce yourselves, we'd love to hear from you. Also, anyone over Zoom, uh, we'd love to hear from you too. It's your turn. <laughs> uh, I, I brought a visit to my girlfriend, Justina. She's an archivist, the Library of Congress, uh, and she's here to learn about Notre Dame. Do we have anybody in the chat? You want to check the chat? Uh -huh. I'm sorry, Don. It's <laughs> been nice to have you. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you're feeling well. COVID intervenes. Oh no. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So that that I was going to announce. Yeah. Oh, that no. Don, Don has is sick. Oh no. <laughs> but, I hope he's feeling better. Oh yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to all of our visitors and uh, and all of the new members. Thank you for that. Okay. So now um, to the presentation by the president, me, of a summary report. So, okay. Jeff, just said, can we turn up the volume? Okay. I don't know how to do that. So. Um, and let's go well, I'll try to be. I'll try to be loud and project. 
So let me know if it's not loud enough. Is that good, Gary? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I'll, I'll be this loud so that everyone can hear me. If it goes in person, it's gonna be a little bit over the top. <laughs> Okay, so I'm presenting now the, the, the summary report on the state of the society, and this also includes the officer reports that I've received um, for, the, for the year. But first of all, I'd like to say that it's been an honor to serve as the president of this society, and this is a society which was founded and then nurtured for more than 120 years by some of the greatest pillars in our community. Um, so with that, um, I'm pleased to inform that the negative influence of COVID-19 pandemic on the society is lessening. So starting in October of 2020, the society began holding uh, executive as, as well as regular meetings virtually over Zoom. And we know this and it's, uh, it's been going on and we've witnessed several benefits to meeting virtually. Uh, it's been uh, an increase in people joining from regions near and far. So this has been really wonderful. So um, the, the online format has also allowed our program chair, Al Norbaum, to invite scientists from across the country. And I don't think we've invited anybody internationally, but um, to, oh yeah, Canada. Very <laughs> 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 exciting uh, presentations. So in October of 2022, with the easing of some of these restrictions on in-person gatherings, we decided that the society would start to meet in person again. So this hybrid format that we're in now uh, was attempted or started um, with the regular meetings. And we have refreshments here for those who are in person um, at the Museum of Natural History and WG33, as well as simultaneous broadcasting via Zoom. Um, also, unfortunately, the effects of the pandemic continues to delay the production of the proceedings. And we thank uh, our editor, Mark Mapp, uh, and the rest of the editorial team for their effort, their time, and of course, their unwavering dedication to, to the society and to the proceedings. So throughout the year, the executive committee met eight times to discuss society affairs. Uh, and I'm very grateful to all of the members of our executive committee for their hard work uh, dedicated to keeping the society functioning well, and I look for continued engagement with the society serving on ESW Executive Committee as past president in 2023, and uh, continued development and administration of our new ESW website, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about later on. And I'm also delighted to be passing on the gavel uh, later to uh, our incoming uh, president. Um, and, and I'm excited to see where he will leave us next year. Okay, so I move on now to our regular meetings and a report from our program chair, Al Morvan. And so, as I mentioned before, he has a new found option to invite non local guest speakers. And he's just compiled a very fabulous seller list for 2022. All talks were recorded, and again, they're available on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Cecilia Escobar, who's not here today. But she has been really instrumental in, in, in helping us with the, the te technical aspects of um, the, the hybrid in-person and, and online meeting format that we're using now. So thank you, Cecilia. And uh, so, okay, so as is customary in our society, the past president provides the first scientific talk of the year. And in January, Jamie Zenizer. Uh, impressed us with his outgoing, uh, ongoing work on the Leaf Hopper tribe, Baltalini. Sure. Yes. And the evolution <laughs> of Rikipteri. <Yeah. laughs> and then in February, uh, he's here, so that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> he corrected me, I think. Or just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> in February, we have uh, Gilpin from Discover Life, and he provided a very fascinating summary of 23 years surveying the biodiversity of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We then learned all about Western uh, beetles uh, of North America from Art Evans in March. And I even bought um, his new book by the same name and he signed and shipped to me. So that was great. 
in April, Miles Zhang gave a, a really great talk on all wasp communities in the genomic age. And in May, we had Yvonne Linton talking about bugs, bats, balloons, and biosurveillance. It's an ongoing work uh, with mosquitoes. So following the summer recess, we had our first in-person meeting uh, with the Zoom component that I mentioned before. This was in October. And we welcome for the first time in a long time, Matt Bertone. Uh, and he gave a really engaging presentation on his adventures as entomologist and director of the North Carolina State University Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. He showcased a lot of really fascinating arthropod images. It's a great photographer. In November, so last month, we had uh, Jeff Skevington, and he presented over Zoom. Um, so it was an interesting format where he was in Canada and we were here. So we were watching from the screen and it actually worked out, like it worked out really well. So that was uh, another format that just worked great. And his talk was just fantastic. I learned a lot about surfeit flies. Um, and, and, uh, and so for today, <laughs> we have um, a talk by Ryan San Lauren. I'm not an audit phylogenomics and I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay, so the annual banquet, President-elect Matthew Buffington organized a successful second hybrid annual banquet. And the annual banquet was held in June 9th of 2022 at Wooden Nature Sanctuary. But unlike previous years, it was held during the early afternoon. And the time change was in response- Are you kidding me? New time. Um, what? Higher uh, ease from from the the venue, and so we were trying to to address that. Uh, so the 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 venue and the time um, of the banquet will have to be revisited next year. So Don Weber, uh, or our incoming president elect, uh, will have to deal with that, and, and as well as the executive committee. Uh, during the annual banquet, the guest speaker was Jay Hostler. Uh, from Uniata College, Pennsylvania. And Jay has authored a number of natural history-based comics. And he delivered an engaging and informative presentation about how visual stories featuring really adorable cartoon bees and really silly ants can connect readers uh, to the natural world. And as in previous years, uh, attendees brought delicious dishes for sharing, uh, and those who were present were able to purchase signed copies of Jay's comic. Matt, Matt also assembled the nominating committee, Paul Goldstein, Stuart McCamey, and Floyd Shockley. Um, and the auditing committee, um, uh, Wiggy, Wiggy Kim, Terry, Tom Henry, and Benjamin Protrick. And, and all of these committees are essential for the seamless functioning of our society. So thank you for, for your service. I would like to extend my thanks to the members of these committees um, and also thank Matt for, for his help. Yeah. So now we move on to publications and uh, ESW editor, Mark Meth. Meth continues to have, like I said earlier, another challenging year as editor. And this is due to earlier uh, changes to our printing and distribution company, Knowledge Works Global, PKJ. AGL, and to continue shortages and extreme delays in obtaining paper. And this is now affecting the printing of issues two and three of the current volume. And we're very thankful to Mark for his hard work, commitment, and dedication during these challenging times. So issue uh, one, uh, 124 one, uh, was produced in August of 2022. And the electronic version of the second issue was released today, December 1st. The third issue was a special issue, a tribute to Ray Gagne. <laughs> and that, that one included 14 research articles and one dedication contributions from 38 authors. And Al Norbaum and Nana Dorton were associate editors for the special issue. And we thank you for your help with that. So combined, the three issues comprised 54 articles, totaling 711 pages. So just to give you a sense, in 2021, 
for the same number of issues. There were 487 pages. And in 2022, it was 692. So as editor, uh, Mark relied on the dedicated help of a knowledgeable group of subject editors, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge them today. Jerry Cook for Small Orders and Aquatic Heteroptera, Tom Henry for Heteroptera and Sternorinca, and he also um, helped with the cumulative index for the volume, so we thank him for that. Rana Choa for Akari, Gary Ouellette for Diptera, Claude Chalkley for Coleoptera, Alfred Wheeler for book reviews, James Anizer for Imiptera, Akinorinka, Mark Metz for Lipidoptera and any general entomology articles that come in, and Miles Zhang for Hymenoptera. And Miles has since moved, uh, he's relocated. And so uh, we're actually in search of a new subject editor um, to replace him as, as Hymenoptera subject editor. So thanks to, to everyone for your hard work on that. So membership, uh, our ESW membership and commun communication secretary, Elizabeth Young, reports that the number of institutional subscribers continues to decline. So now we have 32 in 2021 to 27 this year. Um, and personal memberships are also declining uh, from 236 to, from 236 to 178 um, for this year. So last year was two purposes. There were 12 new personal members added in 2022. But I also wanted to get a sense of the trajectory of our membership. I also wanted to understand who's getting print, who's getting um, electronic only. So I compiled a list of that and uh, that's, that's gonna be used for some internal sort of discussions about where we wanna take the journal um, and also membership and so on. So, so thank you for providing that, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth also um, is our uh, social media manager, or Wrangler. And, and so we have a Facebook account, a Twitter account and an Instagram account. And so thank you for, for providing all of the updates for the, for the meetings and for taking on that task. Thank you for that. So during, so now we go on to the curator and I hope Alyssa Simmons is joining us maybe Nick as well. So during the summer of 2022, our, our curator Nick Silverson notified us of his relocation and he formally tendered his resignation in June, 2022. And we were very fortunate uh, to be able to fill the position with our new curator, Alyssa Seaman. And Alyssa is all cut up with some earlier unfulfilled orders that remain when the position was vacant. And she also started to rehouse uh, and take inventory of ESW's physical assets. And these are housed in, in right now in the library section, the entomology library section here at the museum. And then, um, in conjunction with the creation of the website and the online store presence that we're developing, um, we're also trying to get a really accurate inventory of what we have. So, um, so thank you very much, Alyssa, uh, for her energy and enthusiasm. She really came in with a lot of energy, so that's wonderful. I like that. Sorry, so I can't be there tonight. I'm sneezing up a storm, but good <laughs> to see everybody. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa. This is great. Okay, so um, we move on to finances and our um, ESW's treasurer is Abigail Pula. And right now the uh, auditing committee that I mentioned earlier, we are still working with the treasurer to audit the, our finances. But what I can say is that the total assets for the period between the 1st of November of 2021 to October 31st, 2022, our total assets increased by 20,000 and something uh, for a total of $163,826. That, that's our total assets in society. So is Abby, Abby in the meeting? No. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on. But all of this, I should say, is going to be published all of these reports are published on the proceedings. So, so we'll be able to see that. 
So this, so we move on to the young entomologist group. And this year, uh, so Dave Adamski runs this, and this was on its 11th year. And due to, due to some unforeseen circumstances, the group has had to kind of slow down. Okay. Uh, so this year's recognition of uh, the Yeggers, which is what Dave calls them, uh, has been postponed. And we thank Dave um, for his continued uh, mentoring and inspiring, aspiring, young entomologists, and also his efforts uh, to truly embody our society's prime objective of promoting the science of entomology. Uh, so Dave, we'll see you soon. I don't think he's on there, but okay. So thank you for that. And in addition, uh, the executive committee approved the development of a new ESW website, which I've brought in as a new business in one of the earlier meetings. And um, we were using the builder Squarespace, so we're currently finalizing and we should be live in a few weeks. So this should be uh, making it really streamlined to be able to become a member, to renew your membership, um, to, to access Bio One, and um, to see the directory and then just get a, a lot of that rich history that our society has. Um, and so just be on the lookout for uh, a message that will be coming out to the membership about the instructions and information regarding the website, but it should be seamless. And um, I thank all the members of the executive committee for their contribution toward building this website. Yeah, and that we hope it'll satisfy the membership's operational and public facing needs. Okay. So in closing, I would like to also thank our recording uh, secretary, Gary Hevel, our longstanding, I should say, and also our past president, Jamie Zenheiser. Uh, he's moving out of our executive uh, committee, but but thank you very much for your continued service and dedication to the society. Um, and I look forward to assisting our incoming, like I said, the co president. So thank you very much for that. Hey. <laughs> so do we approve that or no, we just end it. Okay, great. So now we move on to election of the new officers. And I'll I'll remind everyone of, do we have any questions? Do we have any comments? I can't keep track of the chat. So if, if you do see that, I'll let me know if there's something I should be aware of. Um, so nominees submitted by the nominating committee for elected offices in 2022 are president-elect Don Weber. Don, are you are you with us? So Dawn is not feeling very well. Um, so he now can you hear me? Now can you hear me? Now can you hear me? Oh. I think he is. So that's okay. So okay. So Don Weber. Um, <laughs> Program Chair Al Norbaum, Curator Alyssa Seaman, Recording Secretary Gary Hevel, Membership and Communication Secretary Elizabeth Young, Treasurer Abigail Pula, Editor Mark Metz. So I'd like to open up the floor for any other nominations. Okay, I now move to a through all nominated officers. Um, each active member is entitled to one vote. You can vote by raising your hand if you're sharing your video, or you can vote by voice. If you're voting by voice, please unmute. So all those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Aye. Two Wait, three. I mean, wrong reaction. <laughs> oh, yeah, <he> <laughs> <clapped> instead. <laughs> this is clapping. Yes. Okay, all opposed? And you can raise your hand and say night. Okay. I see a number of hands raised in Zoom, but there isn't really like a vote. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, yeah, it looks like it's unanimous. So, a motion to approve all nominees. So moved. Second. Okay. Second. Second. So here, so, okay. uh, the motion passes. Congratulations. Okay, so just very quickly, some unfinished business. So yeah, I just mentioned this. I'm not going to repeat it, but the website's going to be fabulous. I'm really excited about it, and just be on the lookout for it. We 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 do encourage feedback, but be gentle. <laughs> okay, but we do encourage. Um, any new business? Okay. Um, presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. Anybody? Anybody in Zoom? Uh, yeah, my name is James Adams. I'm the uh, news of the uh, uh, Lepidoptera Society editor, and Mark suggested I. Uh, make a short announcement saying that I am more than happy to take any kind of contributions that are LEP related um, for the news at any time. You do not have to be a member. I, I take what is sent to me, uh, more than happy to publish it in its basic form. Yes, I will typically edit it. That is what my job is. So if there is any, any typos or any grammar problems, I'll fix those. You don't get to see proofs back, but uh, it's basically a fun, popular kind of publication and so um, uh, more than happy to uh, get any contributions from anybody there who wants to send me anything. Uh, I put my email in the chat uh, for anybody who's interested. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's jadams at daltonstate.edu. I, I teach at a college called Dalton State in Northwest Georgia. So, oh, and uh, yes, and I, I have my personal website uh, as well uh, on the Maws of Georgia and the Lepidoptera Society, of course, also has a website. So. Anything else I should mention, Mark? <laughs> Wonderful, and it's great because um, we'll we'll add those onto our resources, and then you know link those out. And those are some of the things that that we've been looking to, to sort of link out. And if you have any suggestions for resources um, to include on our oh, okay. website, then please 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 do. Yeah, we'll add it to the website. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Any more? Any other? Yes, I happen to have those journals with me. Oh, like very nice. Examples. So we actually have them here, uh, James. Oh, they look very nice. I'll pass yes. them around. Okay. Any? Uh, I don't have any notes, but I have a. Uh, so Alma, Alma is. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alma Solis, and I'd like to recognize Mignon Davis, who's here. She has stepped forward to start labeling. The, uh, for the Lepidoptera Legacy Labeling Project that came to a complete hot halt because of the pandemic. And it, it, we had it down from seven cabinets of unlabeled material in the Lepidoptera to half a cabinet. And she has started labeling some of the material from Bolivia and Argentina. So I think she deserves a big round of applause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, okay, so now, now the moment has come for our presentation of our announced topic, and program chair Al Norbaum will introduce tonight's featured speaker. Uh, Dr. Ryan San Laurent. Okay, take it slowly. I'll move out of the way. Um, okay, I have the pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Ryan uh, St. Laurent. Um, Ryan majored in entomology at Cornell University, graduated in 2015. During his four years there, he worked in the uh, university's insect collection and developed an interest in uh, Nemalonidae moths. And he uh, continued to work with Nemalonids for his PhD at the University of Florida in the Kido Kawahara's lab. So you may remember 
Tito uh, was our, one of our speakers last year, just a dynamic guy. Uh, but Ryan's dissertation focused on the phylogenomics and evolutionary biology of amino acids. He's now a Peter Buck postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Smithsonian Entomology, and he's working now on noted on. <clears throat> Going. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, and hello, everyone in person and everyone on Zoom. I'm Ryan St. Laurent. I'm a postdoc in this building in the entomology department, and I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing for my the first year of my postdoc. I'm here for two years, so this is the first kind of half of what I've been doing. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about prominent moths, the nodontidae and all of them in general, but I'll also be focusing in a bit on a, one particular group that I kind of directed my focus at the, during the first half of my project. But before I get started, I'm make sure I'm here. <clears throat> Whoops, okay. Before I get started, this talk and a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is dedicated to this guy. This is Jim Miller. Many of you here at the Smithsonian know him. He was, is still kind of the foremost authority on noted onted moths. He's a good friend of, he was a good friend of mine and colleague and mentor. And so he did the first kind of legwork for understanding the phylogenetics of nododontids when he did the morphological phylogeny in the 1990s. And then he did a number of really excellent monographical systematic work on dioptine moths and also North American nododontids published as recently as 2021. So I can't really do anything that I do on nododontids without his without all the work that he did before. And um, he was really heavily involved in the early kind of proposal that I, I put together when I was trying to get this position. And so he was really integral to this whole process. And everything that you see today, you know, is thanks to his, his input. So my talk today is going to go through uh, three kind of key areas, first of which is just a little bit of background about myself, what I did with Mimelonids at the University of Florida and Cornell before that. I'm going to be talking about the research I'm doing here, of course, the nododontids. I will go through some of the kind of general broad strokes methodology that I employ, and then also um, just the results. The re these are really fresh results. So I'm just like, I just recently got the last of my sequences back. And so I'm just now kind of like going through all this data and trying to understand how a very large moth family needs to be classified. And uh, when I get to one particular subfamily during my talk, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of an aside and talk a bit about that subfamily in particular, because incidentally, that's what my proposal was about with one particular subfamily. And so that's where I did a lot of my first, you know, year's worth of work. But I certainly branched out and now I'm taking on the entire family of 4,500 species, whereas I was only going to tackle 100 before. So a bit of context again about myself. I started working on academic research on the moth superfamily Mimelinoidea, which is a pretty small group. There's only one family, Mimelinoidae. There's about 300 described species. They're only found in the New World, principally in the, the uh, tropical New World. And I, I started working on them because I was trying to find a group that I could study where there wouldn't be a lot of competition, right? So I was really interested in Saturnias four, and there was a lot of competition there. And so working on something like Mimelinoidae, there was no one working on this group and there hadn't been for about a hundred years. And so I just realized really quickly that there was a lot of new species, a lot of new genera and just a complete mess in terms of their classification. And so that's why I started uh, working on them. And I was able to do a lot of taxonomy as an undergraduate. And I was really fortunate to have that opportunity and kind of find my niche. And when I went on to grad school, I uh, developed a skill set in phylogenomics. So working with Aikido at the University of Florida, I learned about anchored hyper enrichment and how to employ phylogenomics to reclassify life. And so this was a group that had not been really classified prior. There was no phylogeny before I started working on them. So I like to joke and say that Mimelonidae is probably the most uniformly classified Lepidoptera family because it started with nothing and then you know, ended with a phylogenomic hypothesis where every single genus has been sequenced, everything's monophyletic, all the tribes, subfamilies, you name it, basically all the ones that I, I had described. And so it was kind of like working in a vacuum. It was really great and exciting to, to do all this really novel research, but there wasn't a lot of people to work with. 
And so that's why I kind of shifted gears. And I'll talk about obviously that in a moment. Um, but also in grad school, I worked on comparative phylogenetics. So this is one example where I was really interested in the evolution of the frenulum. So this is a wing interlocking mechanism that exists in Lepidoptera. It's really ubiquitous. Most Lepidoptera have a frenulum. It keeps the wings connected so that way they beat in unison while they're flying. And what's really strange about mimolanids is that this is a variable trait, which is almost unheard of at the family level. And so um, I was really intrigued by this and I was wondering why did some mimolanids lose the frenulum? Why do, why do some have it? And I noticed that the larger ones tended to not have a frenulum. And so when I looked at the, the comparative, phylo, I used comparative phylogenetics and some statistical methods and found that there's very good um, evidence to suggest that the loss of the frenulum is linked to increased wing size. I also uh, did some dating and phylogenomic dating, and I found that the likely low number of mimelon species could be due to a over, like a reliance on one particular order of plants. So these moths are really tightly linked to Mertalis. But that's enough about mimelonity. This talk today is about nododontity. So I was working before in a group that had about 300 species. Nododontids have over 4,500, and that's a gross, like low estimate, I would say. Uh, these insects are found all over the world rather than just in the new world. There are many pest species. They are called the mimicry. There's a lot of systematic problems. They're charismatic and they're ecologically and morphologically, morphologically highly variable. And so they just seemed like an excellent group to get to work on. And I was really excited to come here to the Smithsonian to study them from a phylogenomic perspective, really for the first time. So a quick shout outs to uh, Liliana Pradalara, who's a student in Colombia. She and I have worked on some Colombian nododontids, and I, I wanted to put some of these plates that she put together here to, show, to illustrate the great variety of these taxa. So there are the adults and the caterpillars are exceptionally variable in morphology, color, shape, um, biology, behavior. And so this is obviously just a snapshot, just Colombian taxa, but they are like this all over the world in terms of just the, the sheer number of morphology uh, differences that you see. So now we're back to this phylogeny for context. Where are the nododontids? They are um, in the Noctoidea. In this particular tree, they're sister to the rest of Noctoidea. So Noctoidea is a superfamily of moths, and it's the largest superfamily. There's over, over 75,000 species. Nododontids are about 4,500 of those. So my methodology, I'm going to run through it a little bit quickly. Um, I think it's, it's uh, really important to mention though, especially because all of the work that you're gonna see today uses kind of the same baseline uh, methodology that I use as a, as a PhD student working on mimelonics. And that is using anchored hybrid enrichment, which is a target capture method. So we basically sequence really conserved the loci across the nuclear genome, because you can, if you have a gene that is very conserved, you are likely to find it in a lot of dis distantly related taxa. And so it makes for doing phylogenomic inference, um, it, it's really useful for, phy for phylogenomic inference. So the, the probe set that I use is called LEP1, it has up to 855 loci. And this was published in 2018 by Brian Holt et al, who's a postdoc in Ito's lab where I, where I came from. And I say here that I, I use this pipeline with modification because since 2018, a lot has changed for bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is a very rapidly evolving field. And so this pipeline that you see on the, on the right-hand side is more or less what I employ, but there are differences. There are some changes that have made for you know, simplifying things or speeding up different aspects. And then my, <clears throat> my downstream phylogenetic inference is usually maximum likelihood, multi-species coalescent, and recently parsimony as well. And so this, you, this employs methods such as IQ tree. I always do at least 100 independent runs. Multi-species coalescent is a method for kind of consolidating gene trees, so a different perspective of understanding rather than, rather than concatenating all the genes into one long alignment, and then parsimony as well. Uh, I like to employ dating as well, because whenever you're doing biogeography or any kind of phylogenetic inference that requires a time scale, you have to date the tree. And this is a computationally very intensive process. And so if you're using a program like BEAST, which I, I do employ, it's a it's a Bayesian method, you have to generally subsample your data. And recently there's been a really nice package of Python scripts that allow you to search among a bunch of loci and identify the ones that are the most useful for phylogenetic data. So sort of date is the, is the program 
and then I use those loci that are selected from my, you know, pool of 855, and then those are used for all my downstream analysis. Uh, tree PL is a maximum likelihood method that is not quite so uh, computationally intensive, but it's a, it's a, it gives you a different perspective and it's useful to compare the results generally. And then you'll also see today some trees inferred for comparative phylogenetics. So looking at ancestral state reconstruction, biogeographic analyses as well in both maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods and diversification dynamics. Um, in this case, tied to global temperature. So this is with a statistical program here, GeoHISI. So these are just all the methods that kind of back up what I'm going to be talking about today, but I'm not going to be going into them specifically and referring to them throughout the talk. So anyone that knows anything about nododontids may be interested by this tree. This is a cladogram, but it is based on a phylogenomic data set. This is the first phylogenomic relationship um, hypothesis using a whole genome, essentially, or many genes. And uh, it's it's been pretty eye-opening because everywhere you see a blue arrow, it's essentially a subfamily level conundrum or problem that needs to be addressed. So I certainly have my work cut out for me. I am to you know, try to deal with this across 4,500 4, species, um, but there's a lot going on. And so the next part of this talk, I'm going to kind of just run through this tree to give some interesting tidbits, some images and some background about these different plays. And then, like I said before, when I get to Sororini, um, the, the group that I started working on initially here at the Smithsonian, I'll do a bit of an aside and focus in on those. So the group that is sister to all other nododontids is called Platychesmatini, and these are really interesting because they have a morphological character that is found in all of, or almost all other Noctuidia except for nododontids, and that's a wing venation character that I'm not going to, you know, bore you with today. But this character is something that you don't see in any other nododontids. So it's kind of maybe not surprising that you would see it in the, the sister to the rest of nododontids, whereas all the other morphological characters of this particular subfamily are you know, very typical for nododontids. These are only found in Asia. So the first like big surprise that I kind of ran into and kind of a major conundrum is this subfamily Dichronorhini. And so Dichronorhini is one of the largest groups or was historically one of the largest groups of nododontids. They're found, they were thought to be found all over the world, including, you know, very well-known genera and taxa. But what we found is that the, the type genus had never been sequenced before. And so when I sequenced Dichronura, this moth on the right-hand side, we found that it was only sister to this one other kind of obscure genus, Goacampa, and not any other Dichronura in Sensulatu that we knew about was recovered in this clade. And so that means that pretty much all these subfamilies that have dichronorhini in them don't are not actually dichronorhini. So essentially every genus in the subfamily needs to be reclassified. And that's like literally over a hundred genera. And this is because dichronorhini, according to this data, is just two genera. There's a few other that have character, a few other genera that have characters similar to the type genus, but by and large, there are not many of them. So this is kind of an issue. The next issue, because basically everything is an issue with, with this family, is the <laughs> subfamily Anaphanae. The reason it's in quotes is because this name is not technically available. But I, I include it here because this is an interesting group of African gregarious uh, nododontids. Some of you may be familiar with Thometopoeini. This is a, it was a family, now it's a subfamily of nododontids. That is, is they are nododontids and I will talk about them, but they are very distantly related to Anaphanes. And so anaphyne have this really incredible convergence on a morphology that you see in these European thometopoeine, which are gregarious, hairy larvae. And so it was not really surprised that they were classified with thometopoeines for a long time because of this convergence, but they are really distantly related. So anaphyne is a new subfamily that will need to be, you know, brought about to, to classify the African uh, thometopoeines of, of years past. The next clade is fortunately the first one where there was not any major issues. This is the Ducini, a principally tropical group containing some of the largest species of nododontids, including some here in the, in the southwestern United States. And they are sister to uh, Pygarini. And this relationship of the Ducini and Pygarini as kind of like early diverging lineages of nododontids is something that we knew as far back as Jim Miller's morphological research. So there were certainly some interesting kind of homoplasis characters that are simply easy characters that were unique to this, this clade. 
But unfortunately, the pygarines have some additional kind of taxonomic issues. This model from the left is called Rufizia. Any North American lepidopterist working on this group or aware of nododontids uh, probably saw in 2018 that these were treated as nododontines, a very distantly related nododontid subfamily, but they are, in fact, pygarines, like we thought many, many years ago. And so there's a lot of cases like this where we're maybe realizing what we should have realized before. Um, and, and it's kind of just keeps keeps going and going. So the next big clade is paragosine. And the reason there's an asterisk there is because it's likely should be split up into two groups. Typical paragosines include some of the largest nododontids in the world. They're kind of like saturnids or spinges, big feathery antennae, really big wingspans, um, but really interesting morphology that is really unique to this group. But the other kind of paragosines are very different morphologically. The larvae are different, the host plants are different. This moth in the bottom here is a common North American taxa called Elida. <coughs> and um, it has always been kind of really difficult to place phylogenetically. And now we have really robust support for its placement sister to these other you know, paragosines, but likely two subfamilies are needed here. One of them would have to be new. The next clade is a really large one. This is, I, I believe, one of the most diverse clay, uh, subfamilies of nodontids. It has only recently been kind of accepted as, a, as an entity. And this is because of a lot of morphological disparity within the group. So a lot of spitalians are grass feeders in Central Asia. And so you see this grass feeding morphology, which you may have noticed, let me see if I can go back on the previous slide, two, two slides ago, there, there's a grass feeding group in this clay too that you know on the top these are grass feeders they have this typical morphology that you see with a lot of bamboo feeders where they kind of look like a dry blade of grass um, and then in within within this larger clay of spitalians you see the same morphology so those guys are always classified together but we see that it's convergence they feed on the same thing and that's why they look the same but the other spitalians look like this and are really different and for a long time were never really thought to be associated with the grass feeders but the, the genomics really support this relationship. So this is a group that I think likely has a lot of taxa already in numbers of genera that had not been sequenced before showing up in this clade, even though we didn't realize they belonged to this clade, but now you know, that we have the sequences and we start looking at the morphology after the fact, it's becoming clear that this is a really, really large group. And they're surprisingly only found in the um, old world. So now, now I've arrived at the Thomenopoeines. This is the group I was talking at, talking about early on with that African anaphines, a new group. Thomenopoeines are pests in Europe, a pine, at least one species of pine pest. And the caterpillars are hairy, gregarious, they can cause rashes. They're kind of really like pestiferous taxa. And so they've received a lot of study over the years for control and other kind of applied management. But what, what's interesting about them is for a long time, they weren't even considered to be nododontids. In recent years, we've started to see, you know, very regular, re regularly that the, these moths are in fact nododontids. But what we didn't know is that the African the metapoeines are not even metapoeines. So another conundrum, another thing that I'll have to deal with. So this brings us to our first really novel subfamily. And this is, there's not any name or anything available because no one had ever sequenced these, this clade before. These are entirely African. They have very interesting morphology. They look kind of similar to some things you might find in South America called hemiceris, but <clears throat> they're only like now are we seeing where they belong. So they had never been included in really any study that was systematics focused. And I wanted to use this slide as kind of an example that this is the main problem that we've had with nododontids. This is a group that's found all over the world, but you've had people in North America working on them on North American taxa and South America working on South American taxa, in Europe work, working on European and Asian taxa, but nobody has worked on all of them at once. And so once you start to do that, which is, I basically spent the past year trying to target every single potential clade in this group from all over the world. So that way we can see things like this that, oh, wow, there's an entire you know, subfamily that we didn't even know existed. And then you know eventually describe it, give it a name, define it morphologically so that way we can talk about these things in a little bit more of an uh, understandable fashion. So the, the new African genera or subfamily is um, always really robustly supported in all my different analyses. Of course, I'm just showing you one tree here, but 
I've done a lot of other analyses that you're not seeing with amino acids. And you know, this is just a nucleotide tree, but I'm not gonna get into every single individual tree. This is kind of like the best tree that I have. So um, the, the Fowlerines, the, the next subfamily, the one that was sister to the African group, and many of you North American lepidopters probably recognize them from these caterpillars at the top called Daytana. Some of them are pests of blueberry, um, walnut, and interestingly, Daytana are the only representatives of this entire subfamily in the Americas. There were a few genera that were placed there recently, but we found that they don't belong there, like everything else, another surprise. So the next issue that I have to deal with are two more new subfamilies. So these are clades that don't have any family level names associated with them. The reason being the taxa in these two clades were all previously considered to be dichronorhinae. Dichronorhinae, we now know consistently, is just two genera or only two genera that we've sequenced because we sequenced dichronura for the first time. And so these two new subfamilies, they need names, they need you know, definitions or what have you. So that's, that's kind of the next step. And these guys are only found in the old world. And they are each kind of sequentially sister to Cerorhinae, which are kind of my, my favorite group, the group that I started working on and the reason why I came to myself in the first place. The reason for that being that these are probably the most charismatic lepidoptera that I know of. Uh, they've been featured on the Crooked Geo. They've been in the Microcosmos. They've been, there's toys made of them. And you can see why. I mean, they have these fake faces that are kind of built into their thorax. These tails, which are called stemopods, that they, they rush around whenever they feel threatened. And see, even some of them even spray formic acid from their prothorax. So there's a lot going on in, this, in the, the larval morphology of and so this kind of aside into the serines, I'll come back to the rest of the subfamilies, but is to talk about phylogenetics of serines, show you my biogeographic results, and some hypotheses that I have for how these were able to get around the entire world. Because these, even just the serines are found on every continent except for Africa, or excuse me, except for Antarctica. So what makes a serine a serine? The caterpillars do. They have all, as you can see here, these are nine different genera from all over the world. They all have these really large thorax, they all have stemopods, and they pretty much all feed on salicaceae, which are willows and poplars. So a very uh, conserved morphology and ecology that you see all around the world. And what's really incredible about these guys is um, all their behavior. So they have these incredible threat displays, they're cryptically colored, so they, you can't see them in the plants. This one's green, just like the plants. But a lot of predators find caterpillars from the smell of their grass or fecal material. So what these guys do is they launch it. Like the, these spines that you see coming down are called paraprox, and they fling the grass pellet at really high velocities, really far away. And so if you're looking, if anyone here has ever looked for caterpillars, one of the best way to find them is looking for grass on the ground, and then you look up, and then the caterpillar's there. These guys, it's not going to help because the caterpillar is somewhere and then their frass is somewhere else. And so they're really hard to find if you're looking for their frass. So oh. I'll let you all see that again. <laughs> this is, by the way, an undescribed species from Brazil that I'm working on describing. So there's, everything is new, right? So the moths of serines are also really cool. They're almost all black and white, whether you find them in the African savanna or Alaska, you know, they're they're always like this, and that they generally have really thick scales, and I think that's why they're called puss moths and kittens in Europe. I haven't really gotten a clear answer on that, but that's one of the, <laughs> that's their common name, unfortunately. And this is the first phylogeny of noted of uh, So this is the same type of data, phylogenomics, anchored hybrid enrichment. Every genus is represented here. And so this was really exciting to see for the first time a phylogenetic hypothesis of this really interesting subject. I was going off the text in the bottom left there, but that, that was not intentional. <laughs> <laughs> so what I found, or let me go back. So one of the issues that I kind of uncovered with the uh, serine classification is this clade here, which is highlighted. If you can read it, it says Mary Serra as the genus. And the reason why I'm bringing attention to this is because these moths, the Mary Sura, were previously called Tecmesa. But what we found is that when you sequence Tecmesa, they show up in two places, the heterocampini, the smaller clade at the top, and then the Surini. And if you look at the type species of Tecmesa, they look like this, or 
the type species and another species. They don't have those big thorax of the caterpillars. They don't have stemopods. They're not green. They don't eat salad casey. The moths are kind of black and white. So maybe that's why, you know, they could have been considered tech mesa. But when you look at the serrhini tech mesa, they look like this, exactly what you'd expect to see from a serrhini. So of course, these things need a new genus. And so one of the other things that I'm doing is describing a new genus for the tech mesa that belong to serrhini because they didn't have a name. Uh, to a generic name. And this applies to some North American taxa, including Mary Serra Scripta, formerly Tecmesa Scripta, and formerly before that, they were called Serra Scripta. So these things have had a lot of classification issues, but finally with phylogenomics, we have a good idea of who they are. And a little bit of an aside inside of an aside, in Brazil, I'm involved in a life history study, studying the complete life history of uh, some sympatric Brazilian uh, Mary Saura that have never been reared before. So a few months ago, I was there rearing these guys. This is just uh, three species. There's actually an interesting location of four of them co-occur simultaneously. They all pretty much eat the same plants, Salicaceae. Uh, so it's really cool to get in the field and rear these guys and see their morphology because they have exactly the type of morphology you'd expect, just like you would find in any other Saura. And here's just a quick you know, quadrant of the four species that are here. So the next task that I had was to understand the biogeography of Mary Sur or excuse me, of Surrhini. So when I first saw that phylogeny of, of the subfamily, I saw that most of these early diverging genera were African. They were actually all African. And so the hypothesis was that these, this clade probably originated there in Africa. But what I was also interested in trying to figure out was how many times did they come to the Americas? Because here in North America, we have Amerisura and Percula, two really distantly related serines. So I hypothesized that they must have come here at least twice. And so this is a maximum likelihood based uh, biogeographic reconstruction with biogeobears. I, I include it here because it, it is um, just one of the methods that I use. But the same results more or less were found with a Bayesian method that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. It's a little bit easier to show. And this is, uh, was conducted in red base. So this is, again, a Bayesian biogeographic method. And I'm just going to walk rather quickly through the 30 million years of evolution of serines, because as you can see from this, all these different colors and stuff, these guys got around in a pretty short period of time. So in the earliest nodes in the legacy, you can see they're, they're red. Um, that's because they originated most likely in Africa, because all of these early diversion lineages are African. And then in the late Oligocene, we see a jump from an African, entirely African, to African plus Eastern Palearctic distribution. And then in the Miocene, we see two invasions of the Americas. So ER means Eastern Palearctic plus New York. So this seems to be those two invasions of the Americas that I was hypothesizing must have happened. And then in the late Miocene, they basically invaded everywhere else. So from a really short period of time, these went from Africa to the Palearctic to basically the rest of the world uh, but by the end of the Miocene. So that was really remarkable to see. But in the late Pliocene, Pleistocene, which we did not expect, was actually a third invasion of the Americas. So within our well-known North American Percula fauna, there's actually an old world kind of clade of Percula that exists here. So if you can see this, this clade here, this is Percula. Um, so I don't know if you can see my cursor now, but if you can read it, Percula is a really diverse group of serines. And there's the blue clade, which are pretty much all the taxa we have here in the Americas, North America. And then there's another multicolored clade, which is your old world Percula. But within the old world Percula, there was actually a really, really recent invasion of the Americas. And so we have some. North American Old World could have been due to glaciation because this is really, really recent stuff. And so pretty fascinating. I hope to investigate Percula with a little bit more focus in the, you know, in the future because there's a lot of biogeography going on just within this really well-known and common and widespread uh, Northern Hemisphere genus. Bear with me a second. <laughs> So I was really curious to find out why or how serines managed to get around the entire planet, right? How have these been so successful? 
And one of the potential hypotheses is this reliance on a host plant that is really abundant and really common, and it's actually chemically protected. So salicase is a chemically protected plant family, but it's found over the entire planet. And due to some earlier research on the dating, phylogenetic dating of salicase, we actually know that these plants were found all over the planet before uh, serines ever evolved. So this may have been the pathway that allowed these insects to get out of Africa into the Palearctic and into the Nearctic. And clearly, if you see the most boring ancestral state reconstruction of all time, everything is blue because everything, all the ancestral nodes is unequivocally salicase feeding. There were a few, a few weirdos that switched to non salicase hosts, including this yellow species that's found right here in DC. That's a caterpillar found in, in Maryland, just a couple hours away. And those ones feed on rosaceae, but like you can see, it's pretty much salicase across the board. So this may have been, you know, one of the, the, the pathways that these insects could have taken. But I also had to look at this from kind of a more statistical perspective. And so using geohissy, which is a state dependent method, I looked at the relationship between temperate and tropical temperatures and the evolution of these guys and found some pretty good evidence that the, uh, these taxa diversify more quickly in temperate regions. So serines are actually more diverse in the Northern hemisphere and in cooler areas, which is kind of irregular, I would say, for a lot of insect and animal groups. Usually you have more taxa in the tropics, but with the serines, it's not really the case. And so it, it does seem that these insects do really well in temperate regions. So this ability to, to uh, colonize temperate areas may have been one of the other reasons that they were so successful in colonizing temperate regions around the world. So <laughs> that's my aside into the serines. That was kind of the first part of my postdoc. And now I'm doing all this other stuff with notodontids, you know, the entire family. And there's a few subfamilies that I still want to get to. So notodontiny is the, the next clade. And this is one that's really important for North American lepidopterists because Many of the North American genera of nododontids belong to nododontines. Biosia, nododonta, um, also some others that were previously misplaced, like nodata, probably the most common nododontid in North America, nodata cabosa, is a nododontine, unlike what previous research had suggested based on the morphology. The next clade is probably one of the weirdest ones, and this is something that's going to take a bit of work to figure out what the morphological basis is for this clade because. There's um, some really incredible morphology that's really unique to this group. So this caterpillar that you see here is called the lobster moth in Europe. And it has, I think, the longest true legs of any lepidopteran caterpillar. And the early instars actually, are, I think, are ant mimics. And so they're just weird. They're just really, really weird. And there's even a couple species in this clade that are found in the American North, uh, Southwest. These were, if you, if you wonder, previously considered to be dichronorhini, just like everything else. But the uh, staropiny is probably the new name for this group because there, there is a name that exists. It's currently treated, I think, as a tribe of nododontiny, but um, it will likely need to be uh, raised to the subfamily of Frank. The next clade is a entirely American clade, so North, Central, and South America. This is the hemiceratiny, includes hemiceras, the most, one of the most um, diverse genera of nododontids. It may actually be the most diverse genus of, of, of nododontids. And it's one of the most abundant moths in some places in the neotropics. There are inga feeders, so they eat cabaceae. And this green moth, which is really interesting, is called rosima. And um, they have been really hard to place for a long time. So morphology, some small phylogenetic um, works that had very few genetic loci, uh, had a lot of trouble placing this group, but surely enough, they're hemiceratines. And interestingly enough, they have very similar morphology to hemiceras. They also feed on the basis. So a lot of these kind of aha moments are showing up across the tree, but when you actually think about them, they're not that surprising. The next clade is another name that probably anyone that works on lepidopter or taxonomy would not recognize because it's a very obscure family group name that exists. It was a tribe. Luzerini that was established for uh, the heterocampiny, but that's an unrelated group that I'll talk about in a bit. So this is an interesting one because this includes old world stuff and new world taxa. 
and we are, I at least haven't yet really figured out the morphology that supports this, this group. A pigeony is another entirely uh, new world clade, most well known by Pigia, also Polax is another pretty interesting, really large moth that belongs to this group. And so the next one that I'm bringing us all to is one that maybe will shock some people. If anyone knows anything about nodontids, they probably noticed that I omitted dioptini, which is the group that Jim Miller worked on for a long time. Well, dioptini are nested inside of Nystaliani. So this is probably a subfamily that I don't really see sticking around much longer because it is, you know, it's monophyletic, but it's nested deep within the Nystalians. And I think we're going to need to find some good morphology to tease apart the subclades of Nystaliani because Fortunately, Susan Weller did a lot of work on Nystalians, and Jim did a lot of work on dioptines. So there's a lot of data out there, but it's kind of a different perspective now when you consider that one is inside the other. And so from a taxonomic standpoint, you know, this results in synonymy and other, other kind of prickly subjects that would need to be addressed. And the Nystalians and dioptines, by the way, are only in the new world. So now we've, <clears throat> we've arrived at the final subfamily, which is actually the largest subfamily. So heterocampini is the most diverse nodontic clade. They're found all over the world, even though most uh, earlier works thought that they were a new world specific group, but there are a handful of old world heterocampines as well. And the, the unicorn caterpillar, which is the caterpillar here, is maybe the most um, kind of the best example of a heterocampine caterpillar, they usually have these really large protuberances on the thoracic or abdominal segments. Um, and the, the moths frequently are like wood mimics. They look like wood, like this one here, or Brazil, but I think that. And <clears throat> I wanted to end on one last little taxonomic project that I'm involved in, and that's this black and white moth. It might look like a Tecmesa or a Sururian, and this is why I'm working on it, because it currently is classified as Tecmesa, which we know are heterocampines or Amerisura, the Sururians. But what I didn't mention, and there's actually a few other species of Tecmesa that are not Tecmesa nor Amerisura, but likely belong to this new genus, um, which incidentally we're going to probably name after Jim Miller because he was one of the first people that realized that it was actually a heterocampine, that there were some heterocampines hiding among the uh, sururines. And so this black and white moth seems to be rather convergent on this black and white morphology that you see in a Mary Sarura, the sururines. I think it's the only really truly reflective, shiny black and white heterocampine, at least that I've seen. So it's great that we can describe this as one, one less undescribed genus, but obviously there's a lot to get done and a lot that I have to do in my remaining time here. So with that, I wanna thank all the collections where I've worked, certainly, especially the people that provided specimens that were used in these trees, and all the uploaders of Creative Commons images on iNaturalist, which I sprinkled throughout the presentation. So that'll take any questions. Find people on Zoom Yes. I open up the participants. So I guess anyone on Zoom that has a question can raise their hand. I think Alan can see it better than I can. First, anyone in the room? Yes. So you mentioned briefly um, four species in Brazil that all fed on the same plant and coexisted. Are there any hypotheses around how those uh, species speciated? That's a good question. And this is something that I'm interested in pursuing is trying to figure out kind of like the, the niche partitioning that's going on with these really closely related taxa at literally one single spot in, in Brazil. And I found other locations where we found all these species simultaneously occurring. And well, they all feed on salad casey, they feed on a few different, or two or three different species of salad casey. So they're not necessarily eating the exact same plant. That's my fault, I didn't mention that. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. And what I've actually found is that some of them, well, one species eats really, really small plants. Another one eats kind of chest high plants. And another one eats really tall plants. And so that might be, you know, one of the things that are going on. But you know, that this was one of those questions that would require a lot of field work and time, you know, quantifying the size of the plants that these are feeding on, or the times of 
day that the moths are flying, because I don't actually know they're flying at the same time of night, but they surely are symmetrical. So I learned, it's a great question. What part of Brazil? Those were in the of soul, but all four of those species are found all over Brazil, Paraguay as well. But they're pretty, they're, I mean, these things are really common. That's another reason why I studied serines is because I know that they're really easy to find and they're really common. And so if you know, if you go in the field and you spend any amount of time looking at Salicacea, whether you're in DC or in you know, Alaska or Brazil, you're going to find these categories. Tom? No, the diamonds are rather large insects. And I'm just wondering uh, how well sampled are they? So you got the feel, you know, while you're likely to find more new species than you than were known, they are known for that particular area. Is it a really species group, or do you think most of the species have been collected and, 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 and named? I think what well, is a really species rich group, that's, that is definitely true. Um, there is Alexander Schittelmeister has done a lot of taxonomy of the old world groups, especially in the non African old world. And so most of that area, I would say, is pretty well sampled at this point and really well studied. But in Africa and South America, there's extremely high numbers of undiscovered taxa, which is, I mean, the case of really any left elder group, right? Yes? Um, are you worried about hybridization or are there any known instances? There, there certainly could be, but um, because I'm working at a pretty high like scale here, where I'm just trying to get as many samples from subfamilies, you know, even if there's hybridization, which would be at a really, really you know, low or recent level, it wouldn't affect kind of higher classification questions. But certainly, if I was interested in doing um, really species rich classification or really species rich sampling, that could you know, pose a problem. But I think for these, these questions are looking at the genus or subfamily level. I don't think <coughs> there's also no that I know of um, known examples of, of wild hybrids of multiples. But I'm sure they exist. I know people have bred on like sister species in captivity and have made hybrids. And so surely it can happen. So what else? Help? There's a question in the chat. Question in the chat. Did you find any parasitoids on the a one? Excellent question. And that's a really good question because another thing that I, I'm working on or hoping to work on that I didn't even talk about is that it seems that serines do not suffer parasitism nearly as much as other categories, at least not the salicacea feeders. And I've reared like dozens of serines now in North America and South America, and I've only ever gotten parasites out of a non salicacea feeder, Percula borealis, which is Prunus or Rosacea feeder. And so all the other salicacea feeders should never parasitize, which is kind of mm -hmm. mind blowing. And the one time that I did have a parasite hatch out of a salicacea feeder in Brazil, Caterpillar survived and the moth hatched, which has also never happened any other time that I ever wanted. Anytime a caterpillar is parasitized, they die, like as a rule. But not these guys. So they're pretty impressive. Yes. I was curious about your taxon sample and just this, the specimens that you were actually able to get your hands on. And it looked like that was a very pivotal part of your study. Yes. So, was it all fresh or was it you were mining part of the collection for that? Almost everything is from Natural History Museum's pin collections. We have, I was involved in a, a one of the many, I guess, protocols that were published to extract DNA from older museum specimens. And so this is one of the cases where we were soaking abdomens as recently as possible, right? So if there was a specimen from the 60s or the 80s, I'm always choosing from the 80s. And almost everything that you saw here, I think was from the 80s onward, it was a couple older ones. There were a few that I got at the McGuire Center when I was there still. Those are frozen, flash frozen, preserved, genomic quality. And those are, of course, almost always the best. But the, the focus of this work was to try to get as many of these clades or these named groups that were known. And so like Dicronura, for example, I knew mm -hmm. I needed that. So I just got one from a collection rather than going on the field of fun because that was a really common European species that is really common in collections. I um, was just waiting to sequence. Alan? Um, just following up on that, how much of an issue is missing data? Um, I swear I didn't really most of this. <laughs> this is, well, I'm, I'm working with somebody on a AHE study with Richardson. 
significant. Yeah, it's, it's always an issue because you keep you know, throw everything in, you might get a different tree. You try to try to only look at low side that have eighty percent. Yes, no, absolutely. And so have any way to we never talk solve, about right? <laughs> Paul and I have been working exactly on this question right now because, like I said, this is all really fresh stuff. So the nodontid wide trees, I've only kind of begun to scratch the surface with, with those types of rigorous analysis. But in the surines, I did do a lot of you know subsampling data to um, date the tree, and I would always run you know, like fur phylogenies on the smaller samples. And in that case, at least the, the topologies were the same. But what I didn't mention is in my kind of protocol, we always take the low side that are recovered from 60% or more of the taxa. That doesn't mean that there's 40% missing data, it just means that um, these low, a, a given locus, right, has been recovered from at least 60% of the taxa. And that's one way to limit missing data. But you can limit missing data all kinds of different ways. And this is what Paul and I are doing right now for kind of a sub question that we had. Um, but at least with the surrines, that was a really easily, um, in, or really robustly inferred tree. There was not a lot of top of um, like top of logical improvements or anything. There was just nothing, is, no issues like that with the surrides. The nododontids, we do have some issues where some some nodes are not supported or weakly supported, and so you know, looking at missing data certainly can be the next step. But fortunately, it was not an issue with the surrides. A question in the chat. Um, are there any adult characters that define server? Another good question. Yeah, so the, the only real like published synapomorphies of serrini are caterpillar traits. So you're looking at one there, the big puffed up thorax, the stemopods. You're going to only see those combination of characters in the serines. But the adults have really feathery antennae and the, the the order and shape and length of the pectinations is kind of unique to the group. This is one of the actual first things I realized when I was trying to figure out the Tecmesa issue. Tecmesa and the new genus are heterocampines and they have very different antennae than serines. Serines are pretty unique antennae as far as nododontids go. And so even though I haven't done any wide scale antenna comparisons across all of nododontids, I think Antennal characters, there's also a leg character, a number of tibial spurs, um, you know, two sets for one set, so two sets like most other nonsense, just things like that. But like a lot of other cases, you, there are exceptions in other but about the families and so of subfamilies. So there's kind of a usually you need a combination of characters to so solidly identify this, but you can usually recognize them because they're black and white. Is that so you can of larger like the question, question why are they black and white i don't know i mean there's other taxa that are black and white there's micro pigeons rtis kind of distasteful moths so there could be convergence on some si signal to bats you know and reflect <laughs> moonlight better you know like i don't know it's it's all possible and it's not something i haven't done yet and there's a question here yeah a bit of a silly question from a guy who studies beetles but yeah i was going to ask why do they look like that? It's not not just the adults, but also like that. Like, what, <laughs> what is that doing for them? <laughs> I have and just really curious. Are there any hypotheses that exist, especially for the larvae? I think I've seen people say that like, snakes. This one has yellow tails. But there are some that are red, maybe like tongueless snake. Um, this one doesn't have fake eye spots, but some of them do. So mm -hmm. I think maybe they're trying to do that vertebrate mimicry stuff, but I think Cripsis is their main their main goal. They're black and or they're green, they're brown. They're looking unappetizing. Looking unappetizing and just staying hidden. That looks then, really appetizing. Actually. As the last last you know case scenario, worst case scenario, they freak out and they do this with their tails or in some cases spray yeah. acid. But they're generally trying not to be found by flicking their frass as far away as possible. No. Just blending in with those. Yeah, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting observation that they're going through such trouble to hide themselves from a olfactory sense, I guess, by flicking away the frass, but then they've got these really crazy looking tails and the head that's I know, and red. They don't, they don't <laughs> nearly as much and they're found all over the world, so they're really successful. So whatever they're doing, they're doing, you know, right. Yes, is the frass flicking pound or any other? 
There are other lepidoptera, not even nodontids that flick frass. I think skippers, hesperids will, will eject their frass, but the surines with the paraprox, those little spines that kind of like go down, they get distended by the frass pellet, and then there's like another fork on the top that like pops it out and then it gets flung. That specific, I mean, that's unique to these guys, but there are many other lepidoptera eject their press because it's a very good strategy to um, stay far away from their smelly defecation. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, uh, this is James Adams on online. Um, I was impressed by the support you have for a number of your branches, although I realize at this point you, you probably haven't had a chance to sample a whole huge number of the 4,500 or known taxa. Um, and so I understand why you are suggesting certain new uh, subfamilies as well. Although I was wondering um, exactly what is your standard you're using for a new subfamily because obviously some of them are very clear sisters of other subfamilies. And there are some subfamilies that also have these deep bifurcations where there are two very distinctive looking clades that don't look a whole lot different from two separate subfamilies in one part of the tree that are in the same subfamily in another part of the tree. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, and it's that's a great point. And yeah, this is early stuff, and right now I'm just kind of like trying to see what family group names are available for these clades that we're seeing at you know re relatively deep divergences. But there needs to be some kind of standardization. Um, I, I tried to do this for the monads, and I'll try to do it again for the nododontids. It's it's a bigger task, and there's a lot more available names, and so it's it's just kind of a, me a means of finding a really robustly supported no clades that are always supported. And if there's a name available and if there's some kind of you know character or group of characters that allow one to easily recognize that group. So the, the new subfamilies that you see, you know, are just basically just me showing you that there are no available names for those clades unless I was to expand, like in the case of Sirlini, there's two subfamilies sister to it, subfamilies, right? Sirlini could be expanded to include those. And those could be right. Right, right, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I was also wondering if maybe there was a biogeographical uh, bit of input into those two, where if you have a, a a new subfamily that's all in one part of the world, that kind of makes a little bit of sense too, I guess. Exactly, and so in, again, in that case of the two subfamilies that are sequentially sister to serines, serines are you know the base of the trees in Africa, and then they radiated out of Africa. Those other two clades are you know Asian and then there's another one before that that's principally I think Asia plus Africa mm -hmm. and ecological specialization too like Sorens or South yeah 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 right you know South Casey so there's all kinds of you know characters whether ecological morphological phylogenetic or genetic that can be used and I mean I'm I'm of the opinion that a lot of this stuff is really subjective and just requires um some hypothesis that is reasonable whenever, as long as you can preserve you know, more monophyly, thing, monophyly is Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and I figure as you sample more taxa, some of these things might change just a little bit, but you do seem to have really good support so far and really deep bifurcations on some of these branches. So I would imagine them to be pretty robust already. So Yeah, this was the, the tree that you saw was based off of, I think 639 okay. loci. Uh -huh thousand base pairs um, and if I divide that by three when you're translating to amino acids and you do it and you see the same results that's that's pretty good evidence and that's what I do mm -hmm. whenever I saw these clades in every single analysis and there was morphology to back it up those are the ones that got names even if the clades themselves you know moved relative to each other right, right? so yeah good. makes perfect sense thanks Ryan yeah no problem no it's really good questions could talk all night about that, sure. <laughs> Other question? I mean, I, I'm here all night. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, since the family classification changed so much, uh, what do you consider future work is, sorry, what do you consider future work should focus on? So future work should definitely focus on the classification issues and trying to make sure there's a monophyly based classification, um, but sampling increase. I mean, when you have a group that's as large as this and found all over the world, you never stop sampling tax, so you should. So I think that's one of these cases. I, I know that there's some things that I really wanted to sequence, like from Australia, that I didn't, that very well could be, you know, another 
piece, missing piece, missing link or something. So there are all these issues that I would hope are addressed, but even the smaller scale, right? Like we're even trying to figure out the niche partition here. St. Patrick and Mary Server in Brazil. Like these are all equally important questions. There's a lot to do. And I've got, you know, time's ticking as, as a postdoc. So I'm trying to do as much of it as I humanly can. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Sure. And, uh, now we get to, to the last part of our annual meeting, which is installation of the incoming prayers grant. So I've never done this because we did it online when I came aboard, on board. So I suppose, Matt, why don't you come on over? I've never done this either. <laughs> You've been around. I've been around. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Ceremonial. I don't know. Can we get a picture of this? Yeah. Just, just, just a gavel. Just Thank don't you. move anybody. Just thanks, Eric. How's that? Good? That's on my good oh, side. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Great. Well, congratulations. There you go. Uh, I'd like to recognize our, our departing president, right. Dr. Chamorro. Thank you so much for your leadership over a difficult time when we we're transitioning from uh, virtual to person, and now we have hybrid. Uh, so th hello, everyone in TV land. Thanks for, for tuning in. And um, I'll just, before we close, I just want to say, like, when I was in grad school, this was the society to be a member of. Um, was the first paper I ever published was in the journal. All the uh, people I looked up to were either members or published in it. And to be here now in the same room with my former boss who actually hired me at SEL um, and all my great friends from the hind floor and everyone that I've known for so long, it's just it's such an honor. And I want to uh, make it clear uh, I'm I'm really committed to try to do my best in this position because I adore the society and uh, I want to spread the word how great it is and get more people to be involved, be a resource for future entomologists um, and be an, an agent for change when it looks like we might have a major species decline on our hands and we're the we're the folks like we're we're part of the folks trying to figure it out. So with that. Um, I'd like to have a motion to close this meeting. <laughs> so moved. Second. Second. <laughs> with that, we close it. Oh. And there's refreshments still to finish here. All right, for <laughs> folks on TV land, uh, Thanks. you can look at it, but it's pretty <laughs> <can't>, <laughs> You can go, you can go ahead and mute. Uh, unless people want, you can unmute yourselves. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourselves. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourselves. Can you meet literally a lot of good samples of voice? Yeah, it makes it awesome. Yeah, it's just like, 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 it's just yeah, at least that's the way I'm going to do it. 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 I'